And Mike Hayden, Republican governor from Kansas, is with us. Did you go out and play golf yesterday? Ryan, uh, we didn't get here in time. So, we, in fact, we were back home working. Uh, just got in late last evening. Sum up for us uh, what's going on in the state of Kansas with uh, this drought we've been hearing about for the last several months. Brian, we, we've been fortunate in, in some respects in Kansas. The drought has really hit hard in uh, Dakotas, Montana, Wisconsin, uh, parts of Iowa, also parts of the, uh, uh, the Carolinas. Uh, and in our state, we've been hurt real bad in the Northeast, which is one of our prime corn growing areas uh, without irrigation. In the western parts of our state, we have a large corn area, but it's all irrigated. In those areas, the crop's still good. So we have about 11 counties, which is about 10% of the counties in our state that are really distressed and uh, under disaster declarations because of the drought. In the other 90 counties, it ranges all the way from uh, excess moisture to uh, some stress, but not too much financial stress at this point. You've been a governor now for a little over a year, year and a half. Spent 14 years in the House of Representatives in the state of Kansas. Did you ever farm? Uh, I'm from a farm family, Brian. In fact, my, my father is an active farmer. My father-in-law, who just passed away, uh, ha had a farm. In fact, my mother-in-law still lives on a farm. And my youngest brother is going to transition and take over our family farm that's been in the family now uh, in excess of 70 years. What impact will the drought have, you think, on the election in November in your state? Uh, probably very little or none in our state. Uh, it looks like probably the drought uh, may have very little impact nationwide, uh, I, I would say, that is on the, the outcome of the election. I would say that uh, there's been a great bipartisan effort on this drought response legislation in Congress, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, the National Governors Association, uh, a number of uh, farm organizations have been involved uh, and uh, it looks like that their response at the federal level is going to be immediate. It looks like it's going to be uh, really something that uh, is going to be substantial. So I think by the time the election gets here the, the impact of the drought on how people vote may be minimized. When you see something like this morning's New York Times uh, front page, and I don't know if you've had a chance to see this, but over here is a uh, is a whole story devoted to a poll that was just taken that shows Michael Dukakis 17 points ahead. Uh, it also shows here that when they asked the question uh, which the Republican or the Democratic Party uh, will do more to help the poor, you can see here 74 percent say it's the Democrats. Do more to uh, help the middle class, 56 percent. Do more to help the rich. Uh, they go over and give 73 percent of that to the Republican Party do a better job of improving education in America. They say that 55% or 65%, I can't read that, that's 55%, uh, would be the Democrats. Do a better job of reducing the federal budget deficit. 41% favor the, the, the Democrats. Do a better job of maintaining a strong defense, 54 uh, on the Republican side to 28. What is your, first of all, do you believe that poll? And if you do, what advice would you give George Bush? Well, polls are important tools, Brian. Uh, I don't know how that one was conducted, but I assume it was professionally done. And they are an important tool. I think you, you need to recognize, of course, that the Democrats just had their convention and that obviously public focus is, has been on the Democrat Party since that time. The Republicans will kind of have their, their day uh, next, next week in New Orleans, which uh, will have some mitigating effect on these, on these polls. Uh, I, I think, though, that uh, George Bush needs to do what a number of uh, us Republican governors around the country, and there's 23 of us, have done, and that is take the lead in education. We have Tom Kane from New Jersey, a, a recognized Republican uh, leader in, in education. Uh, we, we, in our own state, I've formed uh, the Commission on Children and Families, which my wife, uh, the First Lady, is co-chairman, uh, to, to get uh, a strong message out that we're very, very concerned about the social issues uh, and uh, very concerned about families and, and especially these, these children that sometimes fall between the cracks of our government programs. Do you have a sense that the polls are accurate at this point at all in, in, uh, in the Midwest from what you've seen in your own state? Well, uh, of course, in our own state, Republicans have been strong leaders in education. They've been strong leaders in social services. Uh, 
uh, we we are we we are we do have a very strong defense uh, sector in our state, especially in the aircraft industry. So uh, those kind of perceptions and, and things are important in Kansas too. Uh, so I, I think the poll probably uh, reflects uh, today's today's uh, consensus. But I think remembering too that a lot of that is reflection on eight years of Ronald Reagan's pre uh, presidency. Uh, the fact that he has been very strong for defense, uh, the fact that a lot of people think now there needs to be emphasis on children's issues and on education, and I think George Bush has got to take that leadership role. If you've just joined us, we're in Cincinnati, live for the National Government Association 80th annual, annual meeting. This is the city of Seven Hills, and when they uh, asked the question, why do they call it the city of Seven Hills, nobody had an answer because there are more than seven hills. But anyway, it's a very pretty place, and uh, we'll be here for the next couple of days with uh, a chance for you to talk to as many governors as we can get in front of our cameras and microphones, and the phones are open. The numbers will be on the screen. Begin dialing now to talk to Governor Mike Hayden, a Republican of Kansas. And I want to apologize to you. Earlier, we had a live camera in the room where you were participating, and you were there talking to Bob Berglund. And did not recognize you, and I'm sure that a lot of people in your state said, that's our governor. And so uh, we, you're a relatively new governor, but still we, didn't, we should have uh, known who you were. Um, what do you hope to get out of a meeting like this? Well, uh, Brian, these are always good because they uh, essentially bring Republican and Democrat governors together in a bipartisan way to discuss mutual problems. I always pick up, uh, and, and my staff too, three or four good ideas from a meeting like this, whether it be about the future of rural communities, which we just came from uh, the meeting on rural development, which you aired, uh, whether it be from the plenary session where we hear some of the outstanding speakers, and in fact tomorrow we even hear the president. There's always three or four good ideas that, that we come up with that say now we could take this back home to our state and probably use it to address the problems as other governors have done. And so that, that's really its greatest value. You're from Atwood, Kansas. What's Atwood, Kansas like? Well, it's a town of about 1,500 people. It's a great, uh, greatest place in the world to raise a family. I spent uh, 42 years of my life there until I was elected governor. Uh, we only have one-tenth of one percent of the uh, elect, uh, uh, elected electoral vote there, so you can see what a difficult battle it was to, to gain the governorship. But it's a small town, a farm community, very, very high quality of life, a wonderful place to raise your family and children, a place where people uh, uh, believe in traditional family values, where uh, patriotic values are very high. You, you know, I, I was, uh, for example, a Vietnam veteran and uh, had none of the experiences that many of my uh, fellow veterans had coming back home and not finding the kind of support that uh, they needed to find for the effort that they had undergone over there. I found just the opposite, of course. People very, very supportive and, and very concerned, and still to this day, uh, very, very supportive. So uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a small, it's, it's, it's small town America, but a great place to be from. Governor Hayden has a BA in wildlife conservation from Kansas State University and a master's in biology from Fort Hayes State University. Where's that, Fort Hayes? Uh, it is in Hayes, Kansas, Hayes, which Kansas. is uh, near old Fort Hayes, which is a historic site where General Custer, for example, during the, the Indian Wars uh, and the Great Plains Indian Wars, uh, General Custer, as many other famous generals, uh, came through Fort Hayes. It was a frontier post, uh, which essentially provided the safety to the homesteaders after the Homestead Act, which allowed uh, parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, and Nebraska to be settled. First call for Governor Hayden, Muncie, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask the governor there as far as the uh, these tuitions for the colleges and universities. All of us are for education. But here, all this uh, talk right now is uh, based on education by Dukakis and George Bush. And the first thing, I pick a paper up here, and I see right off the bat that the tuitions are going to go up 9%. In other words, it's now going to cost $80,000 for the average student. And then underneath that, a Donald Stewart, his college board president, said that the people shouldn't worry because there's more than $24 billion in public and private financial aid next year. Then at the same time, during the uh, uh, deal with Africa, investments in Africa, where you read about, uh, uh, like, Penn State 
has two and a half billion dollars invested in Africa. The universities and colleges in uh, California, something like five or six billion dollars. See, that, that's more money than some of the countries have. I'd like to hear your response to that. Well, let me try to take uh, the two parts of your question. Uh, your first concern about the rising cost of tuition, and it's a real concern. Uh, let me say that in Kansas, uh, our Board of Regents uh, follows a general policy, and I think it would be good for many states to follow, that students should bear 25 percent of the cost of their education through tuition, and that the state and federal government and private endowments uh, for our public uh, universities should provide the other 75 percent. So we adjust, our, we adjust our tuition almost annually as the cost of living and the cost of doing business rises. But we always try to keep it in proportion so that the student is bearing uh, approximately, and in fact we're almost exactly right now in Kansas, at 25%. Uh, and uh, you, can still, you can still today uh, get, a, get a public education in our state uh, in, at a very, very competitive price, and we, we're going to continue to make sure that that, uh, that continues, and I, I would hope that other states would uh, also make, it, uh, make sure that it's important uh, that it exists in their future as well. Uh, as far as the investments uh, that you raise about the endowment associations of our public institutions, uh, I think uh, basically those have to be decisions made by the, those public institutions themselves. You or I might not agree personally with some of their investments. Uh, I certainly uh, wouldn't feel good about their investments in, in uh, companies doing business, for example, in South Africa or, or supporting other, uh, other foreign nations that perhaps aren't friendly to our country. Uh, but I think basically we as, as governmental leaders must uh, allow the free enterprise to exist. We must allow continued private support of public education through endowment associations and really that has to be controlled at, at either the university level or the regents level and, and I think would be inappropriate for, for governors uh, or even presidents to intervene in. Next call for Governor Hayden, we go to Walbridge, Ohio. Go ahead, please. Yes, I want to ask you, uh, how's coming along the mafia is so strong in Kansas City? Well, uh, l let me say that uh, uh, Kansas City is a city which has been, uh, is divided by the state line, part of which is in Missouri and part of which is in Kansas. We have uh, in Kansas a very, very aggressive uh, law enforcement community headed by the KBI. Uh, we, we also have uh, special units on organized crime and uh, we're doing what we can to uh, bring those uh, leaders of organized crime to a trial on charges for which we can prove uh, their involvement. So uh, I think you have to look, one, at the history of the situation, but two, uh, you have to be fair about both Missouri and Kansas efforts, uh, continuing efforts to rid uh, uh, the Kansas City area of organized crime, and that effort is very, very aggressive, and the truth is, is having an impact. By the way, it's interesting when you mention that there's a line between Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. Those of you who never thought about it here, and the, the, the magazine and the Sunday paper here in uh, Cincinnati is called Tri-State because Cincinnati is right on the border of the states of Indiana and Kentucky, and the Ohio River runs right down through the middle of the city and divides and bridges. As a matter of fact, the Brooklyn Bridge was uh, the person who designed the Brooklyn Bridge, first designed a bridge over the Ohio River here in Cincinnati. Uh, Constantville. New York, you're next. Go ahead, please. Yeah, it's Constableville. But anyway, I'm a dairy farmer from upstate New York. And I was just calling because the drought was mentioned and rural problems. And I just want to say that the problems in rural areas seem to me have been building for a number of years. And this drought was just something that more or less uh, exacerbated an already existing problem. Uh, any, any business can have a problem for one year, and it shouldn't necessarily be life-threatening to that business, but it is to farmers, and it's basically because, to, at least in, in my business, is that our prices are set too low to begin with, and what we really need is a system of a fair pricing structure to farmers, and that would go a long way to helping out a lot of rural problems. Just about every rural area is dependent in some way on farmers, and in my area, it's almost entirely dependent on farmers. 
if we had a fair price for a product, it's going to help a lot of problems out because we're going to start turning those dollars over in the economy. And uh, a fair price would eliminate the need of uh, whether corn farmers and wheat farmers receiving you know, almost half of their income from the federal government. And uh, I guess what I'm, my point of view is is that uh, I think long-term policy should be something to do with supply management and fair prices uh, over the long haul. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this gets addressed by the governor's and uh, that, that's basically my statement, and I'd like uh, the governor's reaction. Well, you're, you're exactly on target. The drought, hopefully, is uh, short-term, even if it lasts two or three years. It's short-term in the total perspective of things. Uh, you're exactly right about the overall long-term farm policy. Uh, the, the small cheese plant that was in my hometown just closed two months ago because of a lack of milk, because we couldn't... Uh, keep enough dairy farmers uh, in in production in our area even though we went into several states to get milk we had to close down the plant and uh, your point is very very well taken the American farmer who today constitutes really only about two percent of our population has provided our citizens with uh, the greatest food supply available anywhere in any country in, in this on this globe and we've done it at relatively inexpensive prices uh, the American people spend one of the smallest amounts of their income for food uh, compared to people in any other country in the nation and and our farmers have to be recognized for that and and we do not have we do not have adequate long-term pricing stru structures that guarantee our farmers uh, any kind of reasonable profit and we also don't have the long-term pricing structures that would, would lead us to believe that there'll be prosperity in rural America uh, into the 21st century. Governor, I think I'm being surrounded by Kansans. Uh, we've got you as the governor, the producer of this stop here, Connie Devley, from Hanover, Kansas, and the next call is from Horton, Kansas. So this is Kansas hour. Go ahead, Horton. You're on with your governor. Governor Hayden, I uh, first would like to tell you that I appreciate your comments about um, the uh, health care problems that we're having in the state right now, especially with the malpractice issue. And I would like to uh, hear a few more comments exactly, uh, if you can briefly outline uh, some of the plans you have to handle the outrageous malpractice problem we have. I'm currently involved in the medical field and see this as a, a very dangerous position that we're in in Kansas right now with malpractice premiums rising and insurance companies pulling out of the state. Governor? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the, the problem you, you allude to is one of the most difficult facing Kansas right now. There are four or five things that need to be examined and changed if possible. One is we should review the requirement that we have for mandatory malpractice coverage for physicians. Uh, many states don't have mandatory coverage requirements. Uh, Missouri, for example, uh, only has mandatory coverage requirements for those doctors that live in counties with greater than 75,000 population. So they have no mandatory requirements for rural physicians. Uh, their coverage levels are much less. Uh, Missouri, for example, requires a half a million dollars worth of coverage where we require much more in Kansas. That, qu that uh, issue of mandatory coverage should be reviewed and possibly either repealed or, or changed. A constitutional amendment uh, should be seriously considered in Kansas, which would put a, a cap on non-economic uh, damage awards for malpractice suits. Uh, we want those people, those victims of malpractice, uh, to be compensated or indemnified uh, as nearly as possible for their actual losses. But the non-economic uh, losses have become uh, quite high in, in several uh, highly publicized cases which have, have uh, caused a number of insurance carriers to consider withdrawing. In fact, some have withdrawn or some have reduced their scope of uh, availability for, for Kansas physicians and other health care providers. Uh, so uh, th those are two uh, of the things that ought to, be, ought to be discussed and considered, and the truth is there are four or five more on the agenda for the interim committee this summer and for the legislature uh, when it commences in January. We're here in Cincinnati where they are celebrating their 200th uh, anniversary. As a matter of fact, in the upper right, left-hand corner of the newspaper, you can see there, 1788 to 1988. Next call for Governor Hayden from Kansas. We go to Boise, Idaho. Go ahead, please. Yes, 
Governor, uh, may I congratulate you on having a degree in biology? Uh, I, too, have a degree in biology, 1945. Uh, I've been disturbed at how much of the world today hinges on science and technology and how few of our leaders have any background or understanding of science and technology. For example, the uh, genetic engineering that's going on now, uh, the ability to use uh, splash gene products to control corn borers, for example, is a real breakthrough, but it also has some very great implications on uh, what we do with them, the policy, uh, public policy, a patent policy, uh, an engineering of this science, if you, if you will. And I'm pleased to see a biologist as governor of the state of Kansas. I think it's great. And what are the governors doing to uh, try to get some knowledge base in technology as it impacts our public policy, waste disposal, uh, space exploration, water resources, uh, use of our, all of our resources. And I'd look forward to hearing your comments. And good luck to you, Governor. Thank you, Boise. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would uh, say that I'm, I'm very proud to be only the first uh, conservation trained governor in the history of Kansas and also only the third really conservation trained governor in the history of our country. Uh, I would also say uh, on behalf of all the governors that uh, today the average governor, uh, newly elected governor in our, in our country has uh, at least a master's degree. So we're finding that as uh, new governors and younger governors are elected to public office, the level of formal education among our governors has I increased and improved dramatically and we would expect that, uh, that to continue. Uh, but let me say that uh, it is an uphill battle for those of us who uh, have been formally trained in, in technology whether it be resource management, whether it be uh, genetic engineering, whether it be uh, whatever ever, ever area of science and technology that might be before us as a public policy. It is an uphill battle because in state legislatures and, and on governor staffs and, and even in Congress today, uh, we, we have very few people with a formal education in high tech or a formal education in, in, in uh, in the basic sciences, and uh, it, 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 but I think as time passes, we'll see more and more uh, people from those backgrounds. I tell you, that's what that's what motivated me to get into public service was because I figured out that I could actually do more for the environment uh, in the way of public policy changes as a governor than I could as a professional in the field. First term, governor of Kansas, Mike Hayden. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. We'll be back with another call-in show in a few moments, but first here is Bruce Collins with Governor Kunin of Vermont.